Thank you everyone for being here. It's so nice to see so many familiar names and nice to meet you, all of you who I haven't met. So before I begin, I guess I also should thank Annalisa for her excellent talk last week. It gave me a lot of ideas, a lot of things to think about, and I was surprised and pleasantly surprised to see that there were a lot of overlaps in terms of the things that we were thinking about in, in the context of women do archaeology. Um, so just to, again, contextualize my own um, scholarship and how I do my work, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, my background. So I am an archaeologist. I have some training in art history and art, art, um, anthropology. I mostly have worked in museums. Um, I also have field experience. So I feel like uh, my research, my museum work, and my teaching inform each other. So I feel like this a subject of woman, the toolmaker, is kind of a result of all these different experiences I had. Um, particularly this experience of working at the Hafenreffer Museum of Anthropology last year as the curatorial assistant for the Engaging the Americas project. Uh, so one of my main responsibilities was to organize and um, inventory the archaeology collection, which was mostly stone tools and I was very excited about that. Um, and in connection to this project, we also did some um, educational programming. So this one is from the Humans kind, Humankind's First Toolbox that we did at the um, Museum of Natural History in Providence. So we talked about stone tool technologies, we did some demonstration, but we also discussed uh, local materials and I thought that was a success. Uh, last year, I was a fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, and in connection to that, I, I did some public programming as well, so I talked about prehistoric art, but again, because I have this um, kind of interdisciplinary approach to my work, um, even though when I talk about art, I always bring in the human aspect of it, who is, you know, the, the people making the art, what is their material culture, so I always bring in um, stone tools into my discussions, because I like talking about them, I guess but also because it's, it's relevant. Um, I also been teaching at Brown. Um, let's see if this works. This course called Live Like It's 3000 BC, which is a very introductory course to experimental archeology. span And um, our students basically work with ancient materials, with ancient um, foods, uh, objects, and try to recreate them. And, conduct these little experiments in order to understand these materials and makers uh, a little bit better. And in connection to that, we have one day that's dedicated completely to stone tool technologies. And we actually try to recreate some of these stone tools. So we go out in the quiet green, um, put down a tarp and work for three hours in making a hand axe. So that is kind of the context of where the things that I'm going to be discussing today um, connect to. So I will start this lecture with a little bit of a background into stone tool technologies. And again, this is going to be a very, very short uh, introduction. And then I'm going to talk about how do you actually go about making stone tools. And then I will finish with a case study um, of, of console tool makers. And then I will make sure to leave some time so we can have a discussion. You can ask your questions if you have any. So before we start, just a general couple of terms that I will be using. Um, so we're going to stay in prehistory today. Um, and as you can see, there are these archaeological terms that we use to um, categorize the different time periods. So we have Paleolithic, Neolithic, Calcolithic, uh, meaning the Old Stone Age, New Stone Age, and the um, Copper and Stone Age. So human history starts, you know, with humans, um, but technically we usually prefer to use history for, or historical periods for the time uh, where we have textual evidence and everything before textual evidence, we categorize it generally as prehistory. So again, we're going to stay in prehistory um, for this lecture. Um, and we're going to start with the earliest stone tools. So earliest stone tools were found about 3 million years ago um, by, not by the species Homo, but by Australopithecus. So I have a little timeline here, just again, a very generalized, very um, overarching overall uh, look into this history. There are, of course, many more different categorizations, but I'm not going to go into those. So the earliest stone tools, um, the older one tools, are these choppers 
that were made by Australopithecus um, scarhi and also Homo habilis. And again, these things don't usually get just replaced. They continue over the other periods as well. So Homo erectus would be using all the one tools, but also these Acheulean hand axes. And then we have the Levallois or the Mosterian stone tool technologies made by the Neanderthals. And then in the upper Paleolithic, uh, we have a little bit more um, diversity in terms of um, the stone tool types. So here's again a different kind of categorization. So the lower Paleolithic, we have the choppers, the hand axes, uh, middle Paleolithic, the knives and scrapers, and upper Paleolithic, you can see we have more hunting tools and more specialized um, stone and, and bone tools. So that was my very short introduction to stone tool technologies. And if you have any questions, we can come back to them. But I wanna talk a little bit more about how one actually makes stone tools. Again, um, this is basically most. Uh, this is based mostly on my class um, that we do at Brown in the summers. So first of all, what do you need? Uh, you need the right kind of stone, and that could mean a number of different things. Um, we usually try to find stones that are easy to work with, because most of these students are, you know, flint napping for the first time. So I usually order um, pre-prepared uh, flint large chunks of flint. So I have a couple of examples. So um, I don't know, maybe I should stop screening for a second. Okay, so flint like this, flint can come in any kind of colors and textures. These are the ones that I use because they are more or less homogeneous. So they're easy to break and create flakes. But there are also darker flints uh, like this. That one is a worked one. Uh, but those are basically the, the kind of um, types of flints that we use. I'll go back sharing my screen. And then the, okay, here are some examples. Um, sometimes we also work with shirts. Um, so these basically just are shipped to me um, in smaller flakes that students don't have to spend more time on breaking them into smaller pieces. Um, when I first did this class, I was really excited about working with obsidian for personal reasons, um, because I think it's a very neat material. Uh, but very quickly, it turned out that it was a little bit too dangerous to work with younger people who are doing this for the first time, because obsidian is this volcanic glass, and it's, it is like glass. It shatters really easily when you hit it. Um, and I think I have an example. So it's this very beautiful, shiny, glossy volcanic rock. Um, and if you're interested, you can order these on Etsy as well. Um, but they make really nice blades and arrow points. So here is an example. Um, but it's not really the best material to start with if you have no experience working with it. Um, usually when I was taught about um, stone tools and materials, um, one of the things that we focused on was efficiency and um, how easy is it to make um, a stone tool, how long does it take? So you wanna kind of um, maximize the efficiency by picking the right kind of um, stone was what I was thought. But it seems like from my uh, work that I've been doing at the Hafenreffer and other examples that I've been um, seeing is that the type of uh, material also depends on uh, the color, the texture that people prefer. So just because flint is easier to work with doesn't mean that everyone wants to make uh, a stone tool out of flint. So especially in New England, for instance, um, quartzite and slate were very commonly used materials, even though they're not really easy to work with. So one of the things to keep in mind is that the right kind of stone doesn't always mean the most efficient or the, the easiest to flint nap. And then right kinds of tools, what does that mean? So I try to keep my experiments um, as authentic as we can do it. So we use um, antlers to do flint napping. So you can buy these actually at pet stores because dogs really like to chew on them. So these like large thick antler pieces work really well um, in, in shaping your, your core. Um, sometimes you can also use or find these um, pointy antlers and these are really good for pressure flaking and I'll, I will come to that. Uh, but we also invite a professional flint napper to our class, uh, Barry Keegan, who uses these, uh, you can see them on the right side, um, these copper 
um, edged wooden sticks and they work really well as well but again because it's an archaeology class I try to stick to materials that would be available um, at the time. The other tool that is very um, useful is the hammer stone and these are usually just rounded river stones that you can find um, in any kind of riverbed around riverbeds. Um, I have to admit, and this is between us, I used to go over to the Rockefeller Library because they have all these really nice round pebbles on the first floor outside. Um, so I would borrow a couple of them to use as a hammer stone um, and then of course put them back where they belong. Uh, the other thing that you need is protection. So um, if you're going to do flint napping, you definitely need at least a couple pieces of thick leather. So these are also things that I order for students. So each of them at least get one of them to protect their knees. Uh, I tell them to wear long pants because when you start flint napping, pieces fly uh, in the air. So you don't want to get hit by any of them. Um, and they're tiny, so they, they can actually go into your eye or, or hurt you in really bad ways. So they also have eye protection. Um, wearing closed shoes is really important. You don't want to end up having tiny pieces of obsidian or flint in your shoe. So close every surface on your body that you can. Um, and again, protect your eyes is another um, good advice, I think. And an open air is because these things would be made in open air most of the time again because the pieces fly and also sometimes you have to um what is the right word um kind of um the the fraction between the stones create this like dust like stone dust so you don't want to inhale that being indoors and when you're doing flint napping um, these tiny pieces of stone what, what we call flakes uh, fly everywhere. So you want to do it either on a tarp or on a cloth. Um, it's possible that um, ancient makers would use some sort of skin or hide um, because you accumulate these tiny little pieces every time you hit the stone. And that's what we call the debris. So these like remaining pieces. And you can work with these pieces. Some of them are actually really nice. So every flake um, big flake can be turned into a scraper um, with pressure flaking. So you can make use of those um, tiny flakes, but if they're too small, they're just going to be, you know, discarded. And cleaning up after the stone um, tool day, it's, it takes us hours. So even if it's on the tarp, little pieces fly over all over the place. And because we're working on the quiet green, we don't want to leave anything behind because people walk there without shoes or they lay there uh, in the summer. So make sure that you're you know, cleaning afterwards. The other important thing that you need while flint napping is patience and listening and observing skills. Um, if we usually work in groups, right? We um, sit around this big tarp in a circle. So it's a very much a social activity. You're, you know, talking to the people next to you. Um, as instructors, we walk around and, you know, try to help students. So it's a lot of, you can't just learn how to do flint napping by yourself, just sitting um, in the middle of nowhere, just like hitting two rocks to each other. Someone has to show you, someone has to tell you, well, look, you have to find a platform and you hit it this way. And then it makes sense uh, because otherwise it will take you much longer to learn how to flint nap. And how this technically works, again, this is a very general um, introduction. You basically have a core stone um, and then you hit this core um, on a platform, on a flatter surface using the hammer stone and you separate flakes and you can use the flakes or you can keep um, taking off pieces from the main core and then turn that core into a um, stone tool. So again if you look at this general chart you can see that the old one tools are basically just the core either uh, breaking broken into several pieces or just you have the core um, and then you take off some um, flakes so that you have these sharper surfaces. And the Acheulean hand axes are a little bit more complicated. So you have your core and again, you take off these flakes and then you shape it using antler. As I said, you can do uh, pressure flaking, which is basically um, taking the piece of flake um, and using one of these sharp uh, antlers and then just like pushing against the surface to create 
um, these sharper blades. And then there's the Levallois technique, which is again, you have your stone and then you create this kind of tortoise shell form. And then once you have that form, you can hit it and separate that um, worked flake from the core itself. So there are different techniques of creating the stone tools. Um, this is another one of them. So this is very good for making blades, which I'm very bad at. Um, so you have your core, again, you have your platform, uh, more or less a 90 degree flat surface. And then when you hit it with your hammer stone, um, it's supposed to create these long, beautiful blades. Um, I'm still not there yet. So um, practice, I need to practice more. Again, so this is the pressure flaking uh, that I was talking about. Once you have your flake that you worked, um, you can turn it into an arrowhead, uh, into something uh, more sharp. Uh, you can work your blade to have these little fancy shredders, as I like to call them. Um, but as you can see, most of these tools have also a base because uh, you're going to attach, oh, let's just go to this. You're going to attach your stone tool into some sort of um, shaft or um, in the case of, of the picture on the left, um, your arrowheads are going to turn into arrows um, by attaching them to something like wood or, or bones. Um, the other thing about stone tools is that once you make one, um, you kind of build some sort of uh, relationship to it. So every time I like created a nice uh, looking stone tool, I really like having them with me. So I think um, there's something that we don't really talk about in archaeology is that these objects become your thing. Uh, you have some sort of ownership because you spent so many hours making them. Um, so the discarding them after, let's say, you break them is probably not something you would like to do. Um, so here I have some examples, scrapers. Uh, and if you look at the one in the middle, you can actually see that perhaps at some point this was an arrowhead because it has the like sight formations um, and maybe the tip broke or the pointy parts broke and then um, this person decided to turn them into a scraper. Um, so there is reuse going on um, in making stone tools as well. You don't really discard them unless you broke them into half or something like that. And when I teach about stone tools, um, I want to show students, you know, because this is a time period where we don't have any kind of representations of humans. So we have cave paintings, but a lot of the cave paintings don't really show human figures. They're mostly animals. Um, so we don't have, you know, what we have in ancient Egypt where we see daily life scenes, people making the things. Um, so I try to show examples of artists' reconstructions or artists' reimaginations of these um, stone tool makers. And usually what I come up with in my Google search or any other kind of, um, you know, uh, reference search is images like this. Um, you can see it's, you know, it, they emphasize that it's a group activity. They emphasize that you make the stone tool and you can turn it into a tool or into a weapon. Uh, but what is missing is uh, women and children. It's usually men who basically are working in these scenes. And we know that these men, you know, there were women um, because we're still here. Um, so I tried to find images of prehistoric women and prehistoric children to show my students, but um, maybe we can blame it on this movie, the 60s movie, um, Prehistoric Woman, but there are really no images that show women tool makers. Um, and even images like this, I, until I intentionally looked for human evolution images uh, showing women, I was never really uh, you know, shown one or I'd never really encountered one until I started looking for it. And the interesting thing is that this emphasis on man the toolmaker or man the hunter um, is understood as a crucial thing in human evolution. But if you look closely at um, stone tool technology, we see that Actually, the earlier forms, these old one and Shulian, um stone tools, for instance, they're not really made for active hunting. So you can't really use a hand axe um, to kill a running deer or something like that. So a lot of these stone tools and fossil evidence indicate that these early human species were actually not active hunters. They were um, scavengers. And if you look at this chart on the right, you can also see that most of these stone tool types um, indicate things like 
bone breaking or uh, butchery or uh, hide working or woodworking. So they're not all um, hunting related tools either. Um, so in contrast to, you know, um, man the tool maker, man the hunter, women uh, in these reimaginations are usually represented as this. If they are young, um, they can do gathering. If they're old, they, they are homebound and they make baskets or pottery or they prepare food. If they're pregnant or if they have children, they're usually just taking care of the children. So that's the general image. Um, and again, one thing to keep in mind here is that a lot of the things that are associated with um, women's work are things that are um, perishable organic materials. So if you think about basketry, if you think about leather working, if you think about um, clothing making or hide working, those kinds of things um, don't really preserve as, as well as um, stone tools. And I thank you, Annalisa, again, last time she talked about um, bone needles, for instance, and how sometimes we overlook these, um, these evidence in understanding these perishable materials and perishable material making and how women play a role in making those things. And the other interesting thing is that um, I usually get more female students in this class than male students, and this is just um, self-identification results from my 2019 class. So it's usually a ratio of 70 to 30 or 60 to 40 female to male. And what I observe is that no gender has or no sex has um, advantages over the other. So if you are patient, if you are um, paying careful attention, it doesn't really require a lot of strength or like you don't have to be taller, you don't have to be bigger. It doesn't really affect anything in terms of creating stone tools. Um, and I also wanted to um, kind of show this. I'm trying to learn how to use the adalatl here. The first video is not, I'm not doing a very good job. Um, but hunting as well, it doesn't really, especially if you have the right tools, um, it doesn't really require a lot of different kind of strength. Um, so it is possible that women were also hunting animals um, or young people, children were also involved in, in hunting activities. So now I wanna to turn to this case study of the console tool makers um, to show you another example. So, okay, this is what I observe in my classes, but I also wanna see um, how ethnographically we observe um, tool making and, and gender roles. So there's a really great documentary or um, ethnographic film. And here's the, um, the link to that. I don't know if Emily can put that in the chat. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about what this um, anthropological ethnographic study um, showed about tool makers. So in this um, area in Konso, there are about um, over a hundred traditional hide workers left. And most of them, over 80 of them are women. Um, and in the interviews, you can see that a lot of these women actually learned how to make and use stone tools when they were children and they learned it from either their mothers or their grandmothers. So again, going back to this idea of what do you need? So we need the right kinds of stone, right kind of tools. And these women um, not only just make the stone tools and use them in hide working, but they also um, go and quarry the stones themselves. So we have some examples of, for instance, here we have Sayete, um, basically going to a stone quarry and then finding the, the materials. In other cases, we also know that these women would basically do an archeological survey and find um, discards or older um, scrapers in the landscape, um, especially in farming lands, and then uh, rework them to turn them into new scrapers. And we talked about patience and listening and observing skills. Uh, and one of the things that's being communicated in this documentary is that grandmothers play a really important role in the um, passing of the knowledge to the newer generations. So here, for instance, we have Sokati who's talking about how her grandmother, even though she didn't really like making stone tools or working with hide, um, her grandmother was the one who encouraged her and said that, you know, this will help you in the future. 
Um, and it did. So here we have another woman, uh, Li Kai, who talks about how she actually learned how to um, hide work when she was pregnant with her first child. And she learned it by watching her mother. And now this is basically how she supports her family. They make the stone tools um, and then they work to hide and prepare to hide and then go sell it in the market in addition to taking care of children, in addition to preparing food all day, in addition to actually growing the food um, in their own farmlands. So this idea that pregnant women or older women are limited in their activities or capabilities is just a misrepresentation. Um, even, you know, in representations or these reimaginings of the Neolithic period, which is when people are sedentary, they start domesticating plants and starting agriculture. We always think of, you know, man the farmer, man the herder, even though we know that for instance, even before the Neolithic, even before the domestication of plants, um, people were making bread out of um, wild cereals. So if we think of woman the gatherer who was responsible for gathering these cereals and then making the food, uh, we see that perhaps women played a major role in this transition from um, you know, um, hunting and gathering into agricultural production. And again, if you think about agriculture, agriculture requires a lot of specialized tools, for instance, sickles. Um, and if you are homebound, if you are going and collecting the food, you will also need specialized tools. And there's no reason for us to think that women were not making some of these tools, if not all. And again, in the documentary, they talk about um, how these women who both do hide working and family uh, caregiving, they also do agricultural activities. So if you're interested in this case study, which I think is very interesting and very convincing, um, here is the reference to that. It's an article in the American Anthropologist. And this, this misrepresentation and misunderstanding of um, archaeological evidence is not specific to just stone tools. We also see this with in later periods, for instance, with Greek pottery. We always think of, you know, male Greek potters because some of them signed their work, but we know that they worked in workshops. So there were other artists uh, working under these, um, uh, these master ceramicists. So we have new evidence, for instance, this is pretty recent, um, showing us that there were females intensively working on making pottery because we see signs of, of this intense work um, in their anatomical structure, in their bones. And there's other evidence, for instance, we have fingerprints of both men and women on pottery. So we can tell that there were makers, um, both women and, um, and men. And there's also more evidence based on bones, for instance, that prehistoric women were not just sitting around taking care of children because their manual labor ex actually exceeded of what we see in athletes uh, today. So there's definitely this misinterpretation of the evidence, uh, misrepresentation of it. Um, because I do a lot of work with um, burials, I work on death and burial practices in the ancient world. This is another example that I love showing to my students. So this is um, a Viking warrior burial from Birka, Sweden. You can see it has lots of um, weapons. There are horse burials buried with this person. and. Up until very recently, this was interpreted as a prince, as a Viking prince or a male Viking. But now that we have ancient DNA, we can see that this was actually a female. So again, this is just, um, it shows us that the times or um, the, in, the person who is interpreting the evidence um, may have biases that thankfully science can um, show us you know, the actual results. And again, this is not specific to prehistory. This is not specific to archaeology. Um, there's a lot of data bias um, towards women um, in all sciences. And if you're interested, uh, these are really good books that talk about this idea that women are inferior to men, uh, not just in human evolution, but across history. Um, and there's also data bias um, in all kinds of different uh, disciplines, all, all kinds of different designs where women are not represented in the data. 
So again, based on experimental archaeology, based on archaeological evidence, and based on ethnographic work, there is really no evidence for us to assume that women didn't make stone tools. Um, and again, this is probably um, stemming from you know the early years of archaeology, where most archaeologists were men. Um, in a time where women didn't really have an active role in society. So that could be uh, stemming from this idea that women were homebound, uh, not really contributing, not really producing. Uh, but again, we have no evidence to show that women did not make stone tools. So I'll, I'll finish it there. I'll finish with this sticker that I found in my Google search, um, which I think is excellent and summarizes everything that I wanted to say in this talk. Um, a woman can be you know, caretakers, they can be moms, they can be toolmakers, and they can do things like hunting and being warriors. So um, again, archaeological evidence doesn't show us anything to say that they didn't.